when my dad was in the final stages of his cancer and we could no longer make the half hour drive to Bradford to the Lutheran church where we had been attending. My mother shipped me off to the Episcopal church in town. I could either bum a ride or walk there. It was the church where my cousins went. I remember feeling a little odd that first Sunday. What was an Episcopalian anyway? How did they worship? What did they look like? What would be expected of them? My cousins were waiting for me and my aunt warmly greeted me with a hug into the pew. And I felt a little better. And then as the liturgy began, I felt even better because these Episcopalians seemed to worship a lot like Lutherans. And I was falling into the rites and rituals and the language until we got to Holy Communion. And then as the congregation began to sing, holy, 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 everybody bowed. Well, when in Canterbury, do. And so I bowed. And while it was new, it kind of felt right. I don't know why, but it just did. And so it just became part of my worship life for the years that I was there. And I hadn't realized how much so until I went back to the Lutheran church after my dad died and they didn't bow. And it felt funny. It felt like something was missing. Later, I went off to college and seminary, and in seminary, I discovered they bowed. Not only at the Holy, 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 but any time the triune God got mentioned, whether it was in the liturgy or in hymns. I asked why we bowed and got a variety of unsatisfactory answers. I think they were making them up. I couldn't find anything definitive in books. And so over the years in a congregation now that didn't have that as part of their worship life, I've kind of gotten away from it. And then late last year, I was reading one of my favorite heretics who had a great influence on Luther and countless theologians since then, Meister Eckhart. And Eckhart was explaining that God makes God's self available to us in the three persons of the Trinity, in the Father Creator, the Son Redeemer, and the Spirit Sanctifier. That that's how we encounter God, or God encounters us even better. We experience that God in the midst of nature, in those beautiful sunrises and sunsets, in the, the sheer awesomeness of a starry, starry night, in the power of the wind and the waves. We experience the sun, Jesus, in the sacraments, the water, the bread, the wine, the body gathered, the word spoken. And we experience that spirit within us in those urgings and tuggings that seem to direct us along this crazy path of life. But Ecker goes on to speak that there lies beyond those three distinct persons. that trinity, that God whom we cannot grasp, that lies beyond us. He even goes so far to call a, a nothing God, a, a God who is absolutely invisible to us because it is true God and so far removed 
from true humanity in that respect that we cannot grasp. There are no words to describe this God. This God lies beyond our gendered language, our anthropomorphic descriptions. This God is above our questions. Why? It is not a God that sits there in judgment of who's in and who's out, but far beyond those issues that are so critical to us. It is this God that is so other that this God can hold the entire universe. And yet so intimate that this God lies within us. And that is a good thing, because in the world we live in, in this contentious and divisive world, where one has to really wonder, do we have anything resembling one sense of Christianity, but rather multiple strains of Christianity? In a fractured church, to have a God that stands beyond our ability to pull that God apart is rather comforting. I mean, think about it. Our view of Father Creator can range from a God that is wholly comfortable in the Creation Museum, on the one hand, and on the other hand, a Darwinian God that snaps God's fingers and there's a big bang. Or we can describe the work of Jesus so that Jesus sounds woke. Or on the other hand, a militant Jesus, kind of like a Rambo in robes. And the Spirit can be an incredible power in our lives or something we trot out at rites and rituals like baptism and confirmation and ordination. We kind of sprinkle it around. But this God that Eckhart talked about, that lies beyond, that we call the Holy Trinity, that great mystery, is a God of awe and wonder. I have encountered that God on occasion in those moments when life seems to make absolutely no sense. And I start to wonder, is any of this real? And it's there that I come up against that God. I describe it as best I can as kind of like a black hole of nothingness. But now I understand that's the God that lies beyond my comprehension. It is true God. It is a God of power and might, but love and comfort. It is the God for whom our only response is to bow in adoration, in wonder, and join the church here and in the heavenly host and singing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are 
full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Amen.